Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, welcome back to the main event. My name's Daniel. And uh, yeah, the main event we're going to tackle uh, this week WrestleMania 2, the premier sporting event of the year. Uh, I don't know, maybe. No, I mean, Super Bowl that year had to be the premier sporting event of the year. I'm just guessing. Uh, but, anyways, uh, we're going back to. Uh, April 7th, 1986, at the uh, Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena in Los Angeles, California. And, uh, guesstimating here, over 13,000 fans. And, uh, yeah, the main event. We had special guest, ring announcer Tommy Lasorda. Lasorda? I think it's Lasorda. Uh, special guest timekeeper Ricky Schroeder. Uh, special guest uh, referee Robert Conrad. It was a steel cage match for the world title. King Kong Bundy with Bobby the Brain Heenan going up against Paul Kogan. Um, you know, wrestling, uh, last time when I was talking about the uh, wrestling classic, I said that, you know, the wrestling classic was really the forgotten pay-per-view. Like, everybody just kind of forgot about it. Well, if that's the forgotten one, WrestleMania 2 has got to be the ignored one. Like, seriously, like, no one talks about WrestleMania 2 hardly at all. And it's funny because everybody's go to is like, well it sucked because it was in three locations. Now granted, financially for WWF, yeah, it probably did suck because, you know, you took one of one massive event, you spread over three and I, I could imagine if you actually went there, if it'd be that fun, because imagine you went to that first one in New York, you watch your four matches, and then you gotta watch a big screen rest of the night. Or or even the uh, the middle one. You know, which I think would probably be the best. I'm a big Bower Royal fan, so I would love to see that. But still you get the you know, you get yeah, watch the screen for a little bit, watch some action, go back to the screen. Or the last one, where you're literally just watching TV for half the fucking night, and it's like, oh, we get to do our match? Yeah, and we get three filler matches before the main event. So, yeah, if you went to the shows, I can see you bitching about how, you know, what, what a good card or whatever. But I'm like, most of America, including myself, you either, you know, watched it on pay-per-view, or you watched it on tape, or now the network. So you can't use the it was split up in three different times or three different venues and that's why it sucks thing. I think this card, when you compare it to the first one at WrestleMania One, this is way better. You got three out of four solid title matches. Uh, you know, you had the Battle Royal. You know, I can see people being split on the boxing match. I found it entertaining. Uh, however, it's not really one you want to rewatch or whatever, but you had and you had an awesome main event, and yet this is just the one pay-per-view that people just kinda yeah. Uh, this uh, this a uh, thing I'm saying there. That's all. This, this one of my little comments there. So, anyway, let's let's get to the main event, shall we? Now, first we got the build up. Uh, you know, Bundy and Hogan they met each other. You know, a few times house shows or whatnot. The first time they ever met, like you know, on t television, you know, televised worldwide or whatever. The first time that you know that meeting took place was like in November, I believe, of '85. Uh, you see, Andre Giant was still feuding with Big John Studd. Of course, Big John Studd's uh, tacky partner. King Kong Bundy. And, uh, of course, Andre's best bud in the world is Hulk Hogan. So they had a tag match. And it's 1985, so you know Hogan and Giant's going to walk away from victory. I mean, who else is going to win that match? Seriously. But uh, if you watch that, you're just like, all right, this is obviously done. It's over. We can move on. Skip ahead three months or so. And uh, another edition of Saturday Night's main event, you got uh, Hogan defending the world title against uh, Don Morocco. And boom, out of nowhere, here comes Bundy, sneak attack. Take him down. And, uh, dude, they continued to beat the shit out of Hogan. I mean, it was a mugging. It really was. Uh, Morocco holds him in place in the corner, and Bundy just delivers avalanche after avalanche after avalanche. Dude falls. Hulkamania crumbles to the mat, where Bundy then proceeds to do splash after splash after splash, shattering Hogan's ribs, fucking up his vertebrae. Hey, babe, guys, roll with me. Just fucked up his ribs, backs all out of whack. I mean, this is the first time, at least that I can think of, that anybody's seen Hulk Hogan taken down. Like, Hulk, the Hulkster was down. Could he get back up? We don't know. This is the first time that he was literally just beaten within an inch of his life in the middle of the ring. Injured, taken out of action. So Bundy's like, you know what? I did that. I did that to Hulkamania. 
I want my title match. And he challenged him for a match at WrestleMania 2. And Hogan, against doctor's orders, I might throw in, said, you damn right. Let's do this. Let's, let's go right now. And proceeded to run to the gym and train like Rocky Balboa on a bender. It was ridiculous. Uh, you know, today, any minor thing where they're just like, oh, by the way, you know, you're not medically cleared to compete tonight. You're just done. They sent you all to the bench or whatever. God damn, back in the 80s, you can juice up all you want. And guess what? Bridge broken. You got a slip vertebrae, they said. The doctor is literally just like, listen, I practice medicine. I went to college for this degree right here. I'm telling you, you can't wrestle tonight. And Hogan's like, yeah, I'm going to. So badass. Man, I miss the 80s. Anyway, so, he gets doctor's orders. He's like, this is for all the Hulkamaniacs out there. Got to, got to do it for them. Of course, they decide, you know what? A regular one-on-one -on -one match is saying nothing to contain these guys. We got to put it in a cage. Steel cage match. Bam. And there you have it right there. Uh, moving on to the actual match. Let's first talk about the uh, special guest. Now, carrying over the tradition from WrestleMania 1, we got, you know, a lot of celebrity involvement in the main event. We got Tommy Lasorda doing special guest uh, commentary, or sorry, special guest announcing. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know who the fuck Tommy Lasorda is. Uh, it wasn't until I overheard him, alright, hey, he's a manager for football or baseball or something, baseball. And I'm just like, alright, I guess he is. Uh, you know, if you, if you say that, I'm, in, I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, but honestly, I didn't know who the fuck Billy Martin was from last year either, so I, man, I'm sorry. Uh, up next, we got Ricky Schroeder. Ricky fucking Schroeder. Look, I, I was born in May of 1985, so I missed the first WrestleMania, and I was a baby. I wasn't even a year old when this stuff was going down. So, like, I don't know. I, I, as an adult, I've heard of Liberace. You know, I guess he was a big deal. I've personally never listened to any of the music or any of the performances or whatever it was, you know, whatever. But, I mean, he was considered a big deal, you know. He kind of fit, like, you know, top star status for WrestleMania 1. Was Ricky Schroeder that big? Like, really? Like, I, I don't know. I'm asking you guys personally. Was Ricky Schroeder, like, a megastar then? Was Schroeder mania just sweeping the nation? I, I don't know. It just seems like a really funny choice to me. Like, I don't know if it's funny because he's, like, nobody now or just, I don't know. Maybe it's just because his name's Schroeder. I like saying Schroeder. Uh, it just seems like an odd choice. It's odd. It's, there's like, you know, last year we got Rebel Liberace. Let's get Schroeder this year. Oh, shit. He said, yes. All right. Got him. Got our time keeper locked in. And then um, we have uh, Robert Conrad, which I'll be honest with you, I didn't know who the fuck Robert Conrad was. And I've watched Wild Wild West. Watched it. Like a good year. I used to have a paper route. I'd get up early in the morning to roll my papers up. And I'd watch reruns of Wild Wild West. And I liked it. And still, the name... Robert Conrad did not ring any bells, and it wasn't until I rewatched it. So I've seen this, you know, years ago, and I, you know, I don't pay attention to fucking commentary and people talking. I, I watched it for wrestling back then, so I literally rewatched it, and they're, and they're like, I'm like, Robert Conrad's a referee. I don't know who the fuck it is. And they're like, Star Wild Wild West. I'm like, Oh wow. Let's go real for a second. Let's just go into the kayfabe world where wrestling is real. Okay. And this is why this is an odd choice to me. Okay, so. Look at the job of being a guest ring announcer, right? Honestly, the only qualifications you have to have is to be A, be able to read off a card, and B, have good public speaking skills. And then guess what? You're locked in. That's your job. That's all you got to do. Timekeeper seems like it's an even easier job. Now, I'm going kayfabe, guy. Everybody thought they were like, everybody's got poor. I, I, okay, I get it that, you know, it's whatever. But for realism, timekeeping, what do you got to do? Be able to read a clock. And even if you somehow can't figure a clock out, I'm sure if someone told you, hey, it's a 20 minute time limit, you can set the egg timer for 20 minutes and set it there. And then when it goes off, oh shit, ding, 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 ding. Boom, your, your job's done. Two things you got to do is, hey, keep your eye on the clock. And you got to keep your eye on the referee. Because guess what? When that referee does this, you're like, oh yeah, shit. Match is over. That's it. That's all it takes. That's all that is required of you when you are a, a timekeeper. But a referee, I would think, 
set in a world of realistic professional wrestling, would have to get some, you know, even if you're a special guest, there'd have to be some kind of, like, test you gotta take. You know, you gotta have the knowledge, you know, there's a manual you gotta read, I don't know, something, right? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you're putting together this card, and you wanna, you know, and when you get a special guest referee, unless he has, like, a personal interest in it. Like, if, like, somehow, like, he was personally dragged into this feud, I don't see why you would get, like, an actor to do it. <sighs> Sorry. Mm. Oh, that's gross. Guess what? The show is real, and I don't edit. Oh, I apologize for that. It was just nasty. Anyways, so why would you get an actor to do it? Because I would think if I'm putting together a card and I got to get, you know, got to get a referee, I'm a special referee, I want to get someone who is either A, in sports, or an athlete of some sort, or, you know, possibly a fighter from another, like, you know, someone who, of course, is 86, so it'd be boxing, you know, you wouldn't really have any MMA guys, but someone, you know, who's athletic, you know, or, you know, or has been a referee before, or something, you know, something like that, or just a general badass, because, once again, you know, in the wrestling world, the reason why you don't just beat the shit out of the referees is because you get hit with heavy fines. It makes sense. But I feel like you got a special guest referee, and you're a heel or whatever, you can intimidate him a little bit. A little pussy fucking actor. Fuck you. Award be the mat, you know. But you get someone and they're like, let's say Muhammad Ali, like last year, guess what? Makes a little more sense. He's a badass. You think Orton or Piper or Orndorff's gonna get him any shit? No. Well, deck him. Even with Parkinson's, he would still stomp their ass because he's like the baddest man on the planet. He, You buy into the fact that he could be an enforcer. But they just threw some actor, some random actor, as a referee. Like, literally, and I, I, I guess the argument could be to this, you know, is that, you know, A, it is just, it's a cage match. There's really no rules to a cage match, except you the first one to climb out, either, you know, through the door or over the, you know, cage. So basically, at that point, your entire job is just to open a door for people, and just watch and see if they touch first. That's it. That's really it. You're a glorified doorman. They can go, they can go to any upscale apartment, you know, building in Los Angeles, grab a doorman, and he's qualified to be that referee. That's all I'm saying. It just seemed weird to pick an actor for this role. That's all. Like, imagine this today. Let's just do the metaphor here. Dana White's, you know, putting together his next UFC card. And he's like, you know what? The main event's already set. You know, I got this guy fighting this guy. Heavyweight tiles on the line. Oh, I want to do a McMahon. I want to do a McMahon and make it a star study. All right. I got a special guest. Okay, I need a ring announcer. Okay, I need somebody, you know, who's popular, you know, can speak in front of large crowds, make some jokes, likable. Conan O'Brien. Boom. Lock him in. Great. Got him. Okay, I need a timekeeper. Okay, this job really needs minimum amount of skills, but let's get someone who is popular with the crowd. Get some eye candy in there. Beyonce. Boom. Locked in. Let's go. Okay. I need a referee. I need someone who knows the rules. You know, who won't, you know, be intimidated by fucking fighters. No, I need someone who's tough. Give me a Hollywood actor. Give me Tom Hanks. Bam. Locked in. Let's go. What? That, there's a part of that format that just doesn't work. Tom Hanks? Work? Actually, it, it don't work because, really, Tom Hanks is A-list. Robert Conrad's, he wasn't A-list. I'm sure he wasn't. I'm actually, I'm positive he was not A-list. He's a TV actor. What would be the equivalent to the uh, Eric Estrada, maybe? Eric Estrada. <laughs> Sorry. I'm getting sidetracked. Okay. But anyway, so, but there, there, it's locked in. There's your special guest for the evening right there. Uh, up next, and then, of course, you know, this is actually, to my knowledge, just the first, uh, the introduction of the blue bar steel cage. Because uh, the gimmick was, you know, they needed to reinforce the cage because Bundy was so big and these two titans clashing inside the steel cage that, you, you know, they're just going to rip through the side of the regular cage, so they had to reinforce steel, and thus the blue bar cage, you know, is born. Uh, I'm personally a huge fan. That to, that to me, because I'm a WWF kid, and in WWF from, I guess, WrestleMania 2 up until the Attitude Era, that was the cage. Like, every time there was a cage match, blue bars. Uh, to me, the fence, you know, chain link fence, always looked kind of cheesy or corny to me, uh, tacky. Uh, it just seemed kind of, dare I say, fake. I don't know. I just felt like, you know, really? That's all you can afford is a shitty little 
fence docking on my wall. Uh, but it's funny though, because that's what I, you know, that's why I consider a cage match. I have a cousin, an older cousin, uh, you know, he's always been more NWA and WCW, which is kind of funny because I get to laugh at him because I'm like, hey, my company made it. But then he laughs at me going, hey, your company just ruined wrestling. I'm like, oh, right. Uh, but anyways, but to him, the, you know, the chain link or chain link fence was the cage. I guess the cage to him. And so that was, you know, one of those, you know, little odd things. But, you know, like I said, I always loved the blue cage. To me, I just always imagine, like, when I was younger, when I was a kid, and I'd watch these matches on tape, I just always wondered, like, you know, how would I survive certain matches? Because I knew even then, like, I wasn't going to grow up to be a, a badass, and I didn't, so I didn't disappoint myself. Uh, but, like, you know, how would I escape? Like, I had a plan for the Royal Rumble, I had a plan for, you know, Survivor Series, and I had a plan for the cage match, and I always felt like I would survive good in this kind of cage, because I'm like, I can just run real quick, and I can climb that motherfucker. It's like a ladder, you know? Now, granted, the guy I'm fighting is probably faster and stronger or whatever, but I feel like at least with that kind of cage, I have a better chance of getting up and over, as opposed to the, the chain link, because I just could never climb a fence as a kid. I mean, I could get up there, but it took me for fucking ever. It's embarrassing, and guess what? By the time I get to the top, he's either out the door, or he's just going to smash me and point back in. So, I mean, I prefer the blue bars. Uh, interesting side note, while I'm just going on random rants here, uh, I heard an interview of Hogan not long ago, or I, I heard it not long ago, I'm not sure when he, when he, you know, recorded it, but in the interview he mentioned that, um, you know, they brought up the WrestleMania 2 cage match and everything, and he, uh, actually said he preferred a chain link fence to wrestling, because he said the chain link fence, he says in that kind of cage match, you get a little scratched up, a little, you know, minor cuts or whatever, but he says, you know, it's very flexible, you know, more forgiving. You can slam right into that and just kind of bounce off, no problem. He says, but after the match with King Kong Bundy at WrestleMania 2, he said he went back to the shower and he had lumps and bruises all over him because that still had no give. Like, it really was. Like, he just fucking hit it, you know. And I, know, just, I thought this guy was just a little interesting right there. But um, anyway, so on to the actual match. Um, you know, standard Hogan, you know, in the 80s match. Like, you know, he would dominate starting off get stomped, and then come back. Uh, early on, bust Bundy open. Fucking love that. I'm all about blood sports, so yeah. Um, and of course, he did the same thing he does in every match where he's fighting somebody who outweighs him. He goes for the slam, but can't quite get him all the way over, and he falls back with him and gets crushed. And of course, it made sense here because, you know, he does have the taped up ribs. I'm like, you're Hulk Hogan. Like, Except for Andre, obviously, but like, I mean, he's like big, big boss man. He'd do that, and I'm like, come on, man, you can't be boss man, bullshit. And you know he's gonna pick him up eventually. Like he always end up slamming the guy later on. That first slam he can never get, and, and this is no exception. Picks up Bundy and just goes back and gets squashed. Um, what I liked about this match too was Bundy would always, you know, because early on, dude, Hogan's hurt. Like you know, his ribs are busted up, and Bundy goes for the win. And I liked it because there's two things that bug me big time with cage matches. And I don't, I can't really speak on current cage match, pay-per-view matches, because I have not watched a current product in fucking years. But one thing I noticed before, especially on TV, because, I mean, I get they're, they're really, you know, restricted to time and whatnot. But, like, in the cage matches, they'll fight for, like, two minutes. And then they're just fucking exhausted beyond belief. And then they do the slow crawl to the door. You know, and I'm like, buddy, I've seen you wrestle 20, 30 minutes before. You, you're not that exhausted right now. And yet, they're in there for two minutes, and he's just like, oh, God, I can't make it to this door. I gotta crawl. Or they do the other thing that always irritates me. And this is something I see a lot on the indie scene whenever I watch a cage match. Uh, they actually had an event uh, in my hometown. It's been a while ago, but it was like the Rage in the Cage, where every match you plays in a cage. And I saw this, I'd say out of like the eight matches they had, six of the matches if not more, I'm being nice, uh, they did this where, you know, guy A has guy B down. Now, guy A is not supposed to win the match. So he's going to the cage door to go out, and he realizes, oh, shit, I'm walking too fast because he's still selling the injury. I better slow down for some reason. And he does, like, you know, he's just like, oh, he's got to find some way to stall. You know, he does that half turn. He's not, oh, he's, he's, he's not coming after me. So I got to stall now. And, you know, you can pull it off somewhat if you're the heel because then you can be like, nah, I'm not going out. Fuck that. And you can come back in time a little bit or whatever. But a lot of them would just do this where they just kind of start <sighs> taking a break. Or they kind of go through the door and then pause for like the longest time. It's like, 
Oh, he caught me! Oh, I was almost out. I was that close to victory. He pulled me back in. And that just always irritated the fuck out of me. And I mean, once again, I know I can run my mouth because I'm, I'm not in there doing it. I get it. But at the same time, with this match, dude, Bundy never pauses. <laughs> like, he's literally like, I'm going for the door. Like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And I love that. Like, it's almost like backstage, he was like, you know, Hogan, buddy, I get it. You're going to win tonight. But I'm there right now. Unless you stop me, I'm going out the door. All there is to it. Because every time, he just bolted for it. You know, he just walked normal speed. He's going out. And then Hogan, who, don't get me wrong, 97% of the match, he's got the busted up rib. So he's selling that pretty good. Until he sees Bundy going out. And then he's quick recovery over. I got you. Every time. It's fucking great. But I like that. Because, like I said, it looks real. Like, as a kid, I was like, yeah, Bundy's getting out of there. You know, and then as, as, as I got older, and of course the illusion's wearing away, and of course after hearing everybody say how fake it is, you start kind of piecing it together, and that's one of those things you know, it's like, oh wow, like literally he is just, he's he's just stalling. Why don't you just jump out of the ring right now? Oh, because you're waiting for the guy to wake up and grab you. Gotcha. Uh, so, you know, just little things like that, you know, that you know really made this cage match a little better. He didn't, he didn't stall, he didn't waste time. But of course the thing that, you know, worked to Hogan's advantage, though, was that Bundy was you know, he's a huge guy. Now, he got in okay, but it was just an awkward, like, you know, you know how it's set up. You go through the ropes and go through the door. Now, he's a big guy, so he has to kind of awkwardly get himself in there. So, it gave Hogan plenty of time to snatch him up. Uh, and, of course, I will say another thing. I know I just spent a good portion of this video busting uh, Robert Conrad's balls, but... You know, he took his job pretty seriously. If you watch that match, like, you know, once again, his only job is open the door... Boom, come out. There's no disqualifications. There's no reason. But, dude, he's, like, yelling at Heenan, get the fuck back. Or he doesn't say back, get back. Get out of the way. And I like that because it's like, you know, and in all honesty, Heenan could have had the Heenan family come out, storm the cage, get in there, beat the fuck out of Hogan, and then Bundy could have slipped out and won the title. Like, seriously, like, what was stopping him from doing that? There's no disqualification. What would happen, especially in 86, is you would have had Jack Tunney, come out either that night or next Saturday night's main event or whatever and he would you know say hey clearly that is a controversial tainted victory we're having the rematch and then he would make a clause and then he would ban people or whatever you know from ringside but that would be the the thing there's no vocation but Conrad's like fuck that I'm the referee this is my rules get away from the door because he knows there either to yell moral support you know encouragement get out of the cage or at times he would try to grab and pull him, and I'm like, come on, Heenan, you're not, what, what are you doing? Who are you fooling right now? You're not going to pull shit out like, you know, he's 400 pounds. But anyways, that was, you know, he was there. And of course, dude, Conrad's like, no, nah, not on my watch. Get the fuck out. Um, so anyways, you know, Hogan, you know, mounts a comeback. Survives avalanches, mounts a comeback, broken ribs and all, didn't give a fuck. He's Hogan, so. Uh, gets a slam. Love the slam. Like, not just your typical pie slam. Like, he does, like, a crazy-ass fucking powerbomb. Or, sorry, a power slam. Like, Randy Orton-style fucking... I mean, it was impressive. I mean, you know, it's Hogan. Considering he's doing it to Bundy. It was just great all around. Loved it. Uh, he hits his leg drop. Climbs out. Chases Heenan around. Gets him in the cage. Beats him up. And then poses with the title. Everybody's happy. People go home. Smile on their face. Boom. WrestleMania 2 right there. Um, let's talk about the fallout. So... These key guys that they've met a couple more times, you know, over the next couple of years or so, um, you know, Bundy's still challenging for the title, of course, unsuccessful each time, but they never, you know, fought on a scale like a WrestleMania ever again, or anything close to that. Uh, Hogan had a really good year in 86. In fact, you know, despite, you know, how you feel about him, or, you know, believe it or not, he was a fighting champion. And in 86 alone, I mean, he took out, like, you know, he defended against Macho Man, uh, I believe Adrian Adonis, Hercules. And I think his biggest feud was against his uh, buddy, Paul Orndorff. You know, his buddy, his really good friend that he's close with, that he was just feuding with a year prior. Come on, really? Uh, I never liked Orndorff, I'm not going to lie. And I don't mean that like the, the man himself. Like, you know, the only thing straight, when I say I don't like somebody, I just mean their character, you know, who they're portraying. Like, I, I respect the shit out of every one of these wrestlers that get in the ring. Like, every one of them, I don't care if they're a world champion or a curtain jerk or whatever, I respect every one of these guys in the business. Uh, but I'm just talking about the character. Like, I just remember being a kid and just seeing him be the bad guy at WrestleMania 1 and then turn around and be the good guy at WrestleMania 2. It's just like flip flop. And then the fact that he goes back to being a bad guy shortly after that, I was like, what the fuck? 
trust this guy. Now, I know people have changed throughout time, but usually it's a solid change. Or for good reason, you know. But here, it was like, he just fucking screwed over Hogan because Adrian Adonis got in his ear and was like, hey, you can beat Hogan. It should be you, world champion. He's like, yeah, I can beat Hogan. I mean, I never did before. I always lost it before, but I can beat him now. And then he, he doesn't. Hogan just whoops his ass and moves on, so... I don't know. But anyway, so... And then uh, Hogan will go on to uh, headline WrestleMania 3, which we will get into on another episode. Uh, Bundy, on the other hand, once again, aside from his two rematches with Hogan or whatever, you know, however many times he met him again after that, uh, he never did quite reach the level of main eventer again. At least not in a major promotion. Um, you, know, a, you know, after his brushes with Hogan, he uh, mostly just went back and you know, re-teamed with uh, Big John Studd. Uh, of course, the one thing he's really known for, I guess, would be, uh, or I guess not known for, but the infamous, you know, moment, uh, would be at WrestleMania 3, where it was a mixed tag match, you know, you had regular size wrestlers teamed up with Midgets, and it was King Kong Bundy teamed up with, uh, Lord Lulbrook and, uh, Lil Tokyo, going up against Hillbilly Jim, Lil Beaver, and I think the Haiti Kid, I could be wrong, but I think that's who it was, but, uh, you know, you're not allowed to, you know, no inner, you know, you can't, you got to fight your, your own size, you know, the only buddy can fight Hillbilly Jim, that was it, and of course he eventually picks up Lil Beaver, and slams him, getting a DQ, uh, and then he's about to squash him, but then of course, you know, everybody comes to the rescue. I remember being a kid, now once again, I was, I was a good kid, like, the target audience for sure, cheered the good guys, boo the bad guys, that was me, and yet there's a dark part of my mind that was like, I want to see him squish Lil Beaver, I want to see him just destroy the bee even in the other room. Horrible, I know. Uh, but I, I was like, dude, dude, oh, come on. And then, you know, after they, you know, chased me out of the ring, then I'm back to being a good guy. But yeah, that was, I think that was the first time I actually did have like those, because eventually I would kind of go to the dark side. Like, I became a fan of the heels more than the faces. But as a kid, I was straight arrow, like, hey, Hogan, I'm eating my vitamins too, saying my prayers, training. Uh, except for that one moment, one little relapse where I was like, yeah, I kill the bee, squash him. Anyways, but yeah, so right after that, uh, Bundy would leave the company, and that was just kind of the end right there. Uh, so what I think of this match overall, I'm a fan. I really am. I think, uh, you know, it's hard for me to speak unbiased when it comes to these uh, older matches because I am such a fan, and, you know, I grew up, you know, watching these tapes over and over and over again. Uh, I think it's a, a solid cage match. Is it a technical classic like Brett versus Owen at SummerSlam? No. Obviously not. In fact, it's mostly just two big guys clobbering each other in the ring, uh, which would not go over today. And that's another thing I've noticed. But you know, watching, going back and rewatching a lot of these old, you know, video matches right here, it's very clear to me that like these would these matches would be booed out for the most part today. Like seriously, if this match happened hold for hold, you know, you can even update it. You know, two two, two guys today more relevant, same match. Oh, it'd be it'd be booed. Seriously, it'd be chant boring. Somebody be chanting CM Punk for some reason, and it would just be like, whatever. Uh, which is sad, I mean, because I think it's a good match. Uh, I do think, it's, and once again, it's, just, it's odd to me that this match kind of gets glossed over a lot. Because, I mean, once again, I think the story going into it was solid. You know, at that point, you know, Hogan has never, like, I mean, you know, he's had matches where, obviously, you know, he's down. But he's never been, like, at the point where, like, he was hospitalized, you know, prior to a big event. You know, this is the first time where, like, you know, Hawkamania was actually in trouble. And Bundy was, you know, he was a legitimate big guy. So, and that to me was when but, or when Hogan is always in his element, when he's fighting those giants. Because as a kid, you know, Hogan, he's, he's a superhero. He stands for everything that's good, and he's fighting these monsters. So whenever he would fight somebody like Roddy Piper, which as a kid, now I'm just saying this is just my opinion as a kid, I just, you know, once again, I'm speaking I just never thought... You know, Piper was a threat when I was a kid. Because I was like, he's small. I mean, compared to Hogan. I've seen Hogan destroy big guys. He'll kill Piper. Yeah, Piper has upgraded now, but they ain't gonna last. And it never did. And Hogan always came back and, and beat him. Um, but yeah, like I said, just, it always just kind of surprised me that, you know, WrestleMania 2 just kind of gets glossed over. I mean, it's the first cage match in WrestleMania history. It's the first world title defense in WrestleMania history. And yet, you never see it on any of the highlight rules. Now I understand that since then there's been a shitload of WrestleManias. I had like 30 since then. So I, I get it. Like there are other moments that are considered classic and rightfully so. 
But the fact that this is completely glossed over completely, not just the match, but the card itself. Uh, and the fact that you know, whenever they do kind of highlight the card, they always highlight the boxing match or the Battle Royal, which to me, good matches or whatever. But it's like, this was epic. Like, this was just two Titans fucking... Like I said, I keep using Titans and Clash, but it was. It was these two fucking brutes meeting, squaring off in a steel cage. Two animals. It was it was great. But, uh, yeah, this kind of always gets uh, glossed over, I guess. Best word, best word for it, glossed over. So. Uh, but what do you guys think of the, you know, the match? Let me know in the comment section down below. Uh, guys, don't forget to tune in next week. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Schedule changed up. Tomorrow. Meet me tomorrow. Uh, we'll find out who the uh, main inventor of 1986 is. Don't do that. Uh, don't, don't cheapen this for me. I know, I know. But guess what? Just come with me on the journey. We'll find out who the main inventor of 86 is. Just trust me. You won't be sorry. Uh, so, guys, that's all I got. Thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, yeah, until next time.